Good morning, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Fuller, and I lead Google.org, Google's philanthropy, and I'm so pleased to be here with Richard today. So, Richard. I was going to wear those shoes. Were you? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't. Well, um, <laughs> not sure where to go with that, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> So Richard, as we saw from the introduction, you are known in your creative world in, for capturing in one scene sort of the whole zeitgeister essence of a film, as we saw with I'm Just a Girl. So translating that over to your work with the global goals, how would you, what's that scene, how would you translate for this audience the 15-year odyssey that's been the global goals? I think we would have to, um, by the way, it's very good to be here. And um, I do uh, get sort of nervous thinking about the potential that you all have uh, changed in the world in many ways. So it's a great pleasure, to, um, real pleasure to be here. Um, I think when you're thinking about these goals, which are a plan from 2015 to 2030, the, the sequel, as it were, to the MDGs, <laughs> I think you're talking, talking in terms of sort of massive, endless Netflix mm. series. So as it were, think of the Sustainable Development Goals as the Game of Thrones. Um, there are some, Still recovering. There Still are some, recovering. There are some baddies yeah. um, who will you know, get elected. Um, and then uh, over the time, people who you don't think are going to be very powerful and strong will grow to huge strength and take on power and new alliances will be forged. I mean, it's a decade of delivery that we're now looking for. It's 11 years. So I think it's not one line. It's like every person in a room like this thinking, well, where does my particular power lie outside just the work that I do in order to try and sort of change up the world. I had a very interesting fact the other day that just about the importance of the sort of interrelationship between business and, um, and the goals that someone said to me that if temperature were to rise by 4%, the insurance industry would cease existing. There could be no more insurance because all insurance companies would go bankrupt with the extent that they had to pay back things. So the interrelationship between climate and business and sustainability is so crucial. Well, the idea behind the goals is so brilliant, right? It's, it's, hey, let's do this together. Let's set our ambition, our strategy, our objectives as a global human family. And they're ambitious around poverty and climate change and health, but they can also feel overwhelming and challenging and uh, a bit hopeless sometimes. So how do you stay optimistic as, you, as you're thinking about rallying the world, rallying all of us to take on these, these goals? Well, I don't, I, mean, I don't know how much all of you know about the goals. They were negotiated in, after a long negotiation by 193 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 17 of them. I think they break down into 169 targets. And the idea behind them was to be comprehensive. You know, I think that one of the things that is sometimes hard for all of us is you say, well, I'm going to really commit to this issue. You know, I'm going to support Amnesty International or I'm going to worry about plastic in the oceans and everything. You think, well, while I'm committing to that, one, should I be committing to other things? And two, you know, is, 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 am I in conflict mm. with people who believe those? When we did the Make Poverty History campaign, which led to Live Aid, there was an extraordinary moment when climate stormed out of the room. I remember he was wearing shorts and carrying a bicycle, and we just decided it was too complicated a mixture of things to deal with. And the point about these goals is they really do say that everything is interdependent, yeah. and that actually extreme poverty is a massive issue in terms of climate and that injustice will also lead to extreme poverty so that all of those things are tied together so I think the idea really is that it does give it's really useful to have a big plan I mean all of you run companies you have a very very complex agenda towards absolutely everything that you do you're used to complexity and the idea that you could solve the problems of the world by sort of three simple nice phrases would be ridiculous so the goals do actually give you an opportunity to put everything 
next to everything so that you actually can align the policies of a government or the policies of a business next to it and see really how you're doing. And I think that makes us feel very safe and very, you know, united. But do you ever... Do you ever feel that the challenges are just, you know, too far away and that we're not making the kind of progress that we should as a globe? Or do you see hope in some of the indicators that we're seeing at this point well, for where I, we're going? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a naturally uh, an optimist. And, uh, I mean, there are clearly a lot of very uh, dark things in the world, but that... that speech you just saw President Obama say, you know, he said if there was one moment mm. in the history of the world in which you would be best to be born, that moment is now. I saw an astonishing graphic of mortality in African countries yeah. between 1950 and, 19, and 2020 the other day, which was, you know, all in lines. And they just went, da, 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 just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And you do see extraordinary... I mean, you just have to look out for things to be optimistic about. When I write my romantic films, I'm sometimes accused of being sentimental yes. and, <laughs> uh, and untrue. And I don't understand that at all. So if someone, <laughs> someone makes a film about a serial killer, there have only ever been four of them, um, and it's called a, you know, a searingly realistic portrayal of the problems facing modern society... And I write a film about love, and probably at least 60% of you are in love with someone at the moment, and there are <laughs> 7 million people in love in London, and for some reason it's called sentimental and unrealistic and untrue. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it just depends which way, you know, which way you look. And my experience, when I started Comet Relief, you know, I was depending on comedians many of the least nice people in the world, and certainly the most <laughs> selfish. And I was saying to them, well, you do what you can for charity, and we've raised yeah. whatever it is, 1.3 billion. And, and, and the, what's happening in terms of diseases is extraordinary. And I remember I wrote a film about malaria, and I had a very angry <laughs> phone call from the director of it saying... And it took a while to make. And, I have a, and he said, you haven't even checked your fucking facts. He said, you know, there's only 250,000 children died of malaria this year, not, as I had in the script, 500,000. And it was because in the four years since I'd originally written it, the number had gone down yeah. so dramatically. And I said to you, by the way, this is good news, I said to right. him, not, not yes. bad news. <laughs> uh, if I'm a bad, if I'm an inaccurate writer, it's, a, it's good news. But I do look around me and I think that, I mean, you must all feel that there is power in technology to do bad, but astonishing power in technology uh, to do good. There's, you know, terrible worries about climate change, but an astonishingly empowered younger generation that has suddenly started to get the message. It, tremendous questions of, you know, inequality in terms, you know, particularly of men and women, but, you know, we are also the Me Too generation. Things ignite, things change. So I think you have to as I often say, you know, cynics nose day has never yeah. made any money yet, not, <laughs> not a single dollar. And I think that if you're optimistic and if you view the things that are working, and I think then the goals provides a plan for that, there is no reason not to think that you can't change the world magnificently. Well, you have been obviously so successful um, in getting your films out globally. People know and love them everywhere. As you think about this part of your life where you're trying to get the world, the globe, to know about and think about and care about the Global Glows, how do you think, you know, what's the best way to do that? How do you inspire people to, to be involved and, and reach people? Well, I mean, I've taken rather a, a sort of, when you make films, the people you hate most are the people who make the posters and the trailers, hmm. um, particularly the posters. A <laughs> ghastly retouched mm -hmm. photograph. Any poster makers here? Just probably, like probably not even with your star's actual bottom. Probably somebody else's <laughs> bottom on the photograph. 
and then and then you know a line you didn't write yeah. so this whole thing that you've made that you've put so much effort into well i'm the poster guy for the goals i'm trying to make them we came up with this graphic we're trying to make them simple we argued about you know trying to keep the names of them short and i'm just trying to get the word out there because what you want is that when people you know go to their employees and say let's do something about the goals you want them to have just glimpsed them heard yes. of them come across them in some way when you make a film there's a big tradition now of you know trying to sort of get some shot of the making of the film into the newspapers so that when people see the poster, it's the second time they've heard about it. And when they see the trailer, it's the third time, and then they may be tempted to go and see the film. So what we're trying to do is to spread the word in as many ways as we can, through pop music, through concerts, through graphics, through this thing we call, do called the world's largest lessons, through partnerships, through businesses, you know, to try and get the idea of them out there so that when people actually, you know, in companies and in politics yeah. focus on them, they believe that it's something that the public will endorse and possibly feel passionate about. And one of the things that we've chatted about backstage is just, you know, the role of technology. So how are you seeing uh, technology advancing and being able to help us to get, get to these goals? I think you probably know the answer <laughs> to that better than I do. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, there's an enormous amount uh, that technology can do. I mean, one of the, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, you do look for technology to have some of the, you know, actual answers, but yeah. certainly we have never been in a world where there's more possibility for a message going virally and hugely, and then once you get that message, as it were, being able to press on the button of each of these and see what are the things that you can do. Because by the way, I'm a huge believer that we can do things individually in our lives. And I think that is a very good way of, as it were, starting with Meatless Monday and Giving yeah. Tuesday and mm. um, Change Your Pension Scheme Wednesday and watch out what you wear <laughs> Thursday. I do want to talk to you about pensions. But no, but tell me, Jacqueline, I mean, what's your sense about what Google could do and what technology can do for the goals? Because that's the world in which, as it were, my kids are living, and most yeah. people are referring to that for their information and their passion. Well, you know, I think, like you were saying, we've, we've seen great progress, and in some ways, you know, we've, we've had child poverty and great advances in health, but the rest of the gap is really going to take new solutions, and I think that's where technology, especially AI, can be really helpful. We just, uh, you know, at Google, we've been trying to think about how can we inspire the world, especially young technologists, uh, people who are researching nonprofits, uh, social businesses, to, to align their work with, with the global goals. And so one of the things that we did is we, um, we actually launched a competition this last year, an open call, where we put out $25 million in a, uh, a pool of funding and then uh, expertise from our AI professionals, and then said, OK, right, tell us your idea. Align it with the global goals. Tell us how you're going to use AI. And the winners, which we just uh, announced, you know, they're doing incredible work. For example, a team in Africa at, in uh, Uganda is using really low-cost sensors that they're putting on the backs of motorcycle taxis. And they're using that to map and track air pollution, which is one of the silent killers. And then um, using that to measure uh, what's being effective in fighting that air pollution. A team in India, for example, is using AI to help diagnose what the, the pests and the diseases are that subsistence farmers are facing, and then um, put the right pesticide against that. And that's going to help not only the farmers to earn more income, but it's going to help reduce pesticide use, which is going to help the environment. Médecins Sans Frontières uh, was one of our winners here in Europe, and they're doing amazing work on antibiotic resistance. So they have a smartphone app that an untrained uh, uh, community worker in the field could use in a low resource environment to uh, read whether uh, the bacteria that someone has is resistant. That way they're going to do better health for the individual, but they're also going to help the, the globe with this kind of resistance. So there's all sorts of ideas, many of them being led out of the global south on how we can apply AI. So we, we are just trying to think about how can we seed and support, inspire those kinds of technologies. So we also published some research on our site. You know, a lot of people think AI is just sort of 
magic pixie dust and don't, you know, they know it's super powerful and has so many opportunities, but don't know exactly how that could apply to their, their cause, the issue that they care about. So we published some research on our site, um, AIs for Social Impact uh, at Google, and you can see there how, what are all the AI technologies that are showing the most promise for each of the global goals. So I think this kind of building the ecosystem and, and building up partners who are, are working on this issue is, is the way that we're gonna get technology to help us accelerate and close that gap. I mean, that is so exciting to me. I do think that this idea that we may have a generation now, and I hope it applies to everyone here that thinks, what is my work for if it's not for trying to make the world better? I believe that, I, I'm, I may be making this up, but I think um, Paul Palmer told me that they, they did two ads for the same job at Unilever, and they tested one which stressed what Unilever does for the world and its sort of yeah. sustainable commitments, and the other one that stressed the perks and the wages. And many, many more people applied through the ad on the sustainability and what they do. And I think the idea that you can point a generation in the direction of thinking that it's a both and. Yes. You don't need to say, well, I'm either going to make a lot of money and sell my patent for millions, or I'm going to change the world. You can make yes. a patent yes. Yes, that and. changes the world, and then you can also <laughs> make a lot of money. Well, I think you're right that many people are motivated, <clears throat> and many people just want to know, what can I do? So what would you say, Richard, to this audience, uh, if they want to get behind the, the global goals and help with the work that you're doing? Well, I mean, I think there are there is enormous number of things that you can do. One just in your own lives, as I was saying, think about the things which could make a difference. I'm really finding that helpful. I will now buy an electric car because <laughs> I just think that it's important to, to know that in the texture of your own lives, you're actually doing things uh, that you're meant to do because that's what, um, you know, it then inspires you texturally. I think that it is really, it would be brilliant to communicate something about the goals to your employees, because I do think this is a sort of bounce thing. The moment that you say to the people who work for you, we're interested in these things, have a look at them, check them out yourselves, and then, as it were, counter check with us, I think that you will find an amazingly interesting dialogue between you on all the areas of your behavior, on your supply chains, on you know gender equality, on how you're infecting the environment. I think that would be an amazingly helpful dialogue. Check your pension funds. I think this hmm. is a really interesting idea. You know, someone said to me the other day that like a third of the world's money is owned by governments, a third of it's owned by rich people, and a third of it's owned by us, as it were. You know, we, the way that we're going to get more investment in all the extraordinary projects like the ones that you're describing is by pension funds and investment investing increasingly in sustainability and in impact and in those things that will change the world. And I would love the feeling that when you start to talk to your employees, they will say, well, how's our pension fund invested? Where's our money going? And that will increasingly go into all the best projects that they can do. And that some of those projects will, of course, be things that you yourselves are working on. Yeah. So I think it's just to introduce it into the environment of the place that you work and then really check out whether or not the things that you do are in accordance with it. It'll be helpful. If it hadn't been for the Ten Commandments, I would have been committing adultery and murdering people <laughs> um, every day of the week. But I was definitely told, <laughs> definitely told I mustn't do those things. Keep that out um, of the pension fund. And so I just think that it's a really useful purpose and plan. And if you don't know them, this is the time, by the way, because in 2005, when we did the Make Poverty History campaign in Live Aid, I couldn't, the meetings with people in business were so ghastly. They really just thought this is a bunch of dangerous lefties who want to give away all their money. And now, business, as you know, as it were you talking about the things that you're backing, they're actually ahead. They're the ones who've seen that there's a, whatever Business for a Better World said, 12 trillion advantage in actually working for and investing in the goals. People can see that that's the way that business should go. So this is exactly the moment. And if we can create a dialogue between business 
and government, because governments much prefer talking to businesses than they do talking <laughs> to charities. They hate charity people. They always just go on repeating themselves. Um, but if you can start a dialogue, 2020 is the moment to kind of start the second phase of the goals. And so anything that any of you can do and want to have a conversation with us and Project Everyone, you know, would be dreaming. Yes. Well, I think we can end on, on that note. And Richard, you and Kate will be around for a bit if people want to talk yeah. about how, how you can get involved in helping Project Everyone. You want to raise your hand? There we are. Um, then we have, we have the ways to do that. Well, Richard, thank you so much for everything that you've done. You know, people who have uh, you know, wealth and power and reach and global access, you could be doing a lot of things with your time. So thank you on behalf of the world for no. focusing your attention on this. No. Let's all thank Richard. Oh, well. <laughs> Um, well, no. no, can I just say, I just look around the room and I see so many people who I know are doing absolutely amazing things and I can't thank you all at Google enough for what you're now doing with us. And I just think that, you know, when you open the door, this is my experience, is that yeah. when you open the door and say to people, this is, you, if you walk through this door, you can change other people's lives. There's only about nine people in the world who don't want to go through that door. Well, let's walk through that door together, all right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>